Poštovani gledatelji, dobra večer i dobrodošli u posljednju epizodu posebnog izdanja poduzetničkog mindseta. U prošloj epizodi razgovarali smo o životu i poslovanju u Hrvatskoj. Tako su mogli čuti razmišljanja Jakova Urbanka iz HSM informatike, razgovor možda i dva najpoznatija stranca u Hrvatskoj, Pola Bredburija i Ana de Jonga, te promišljanja o svijetu i životu našeg najpoznatijeg astronoma Korada Korlevića. Za kraj ove serije specijala sačuvali smo gostovanje čovjeka čije ime postalo gotovo sinonim za poduzetništvo. Emil Tedeski, danas je jedan od najuspješnijih poduzetnika u Hrvatskoj regiji, predsjednik uprave većinski vlasnik Atlanti Grupe, uspješno vodi ovog tržišnog giganta već gotovo tri desetljeća. Po stažu iskustvu i uspjehu u Australiji parira mu Manny Stool, vlasnik svjetski poznate tvrtke Moose Toys, te prvi australac koji je odnio titulu Ivaj svjetskog poduzetnika godine, nakon čega postaje i član žirija u istom programu, a zadnju godinu i njegov predsjednik. Pogledajmo prvi dio razgovora Emila Tedeskija i Menija Stula, snimljenog posebno za konferenciju Poduzetnički manjce. tremendous uh, privilege to have with us uh, the true entrepreneur uh, Manny Stuhl from uh, Australia. Uh, to cut uh, the long story short, uh, the Manny has been voted the entrepreneur of the year uh, globally by the EY. And uh, instead of telling that uh, the, the Manny is entrepreneur in the heart, Uh, heavyweight, uh, the true billionaire, I would say uh, we will not spend so much time of introduction. I would like you to know uh, many and to learn from him the honest story, all the challenges and the key elements to make him tremendously successful, but also to feel uh, his potential fears or uh, question marks regarding the current COVID-19 situation for the global entrepreneur. Good morning, Manny. Uh, good afternoon, my time. But yes, good morning to you. Thanks. Good, uh, good evening. Good evening, my time. It's rich <laughs> Good evening. Uh, uh, anyhow, I'm speaking from island of Hvar, Croatia. Where are you now for the moment? Perth, Australia? No, I'm in Melbourne. Oh, uh, you're in Melbourne. Great. Uh, could you be so kind, Manny, and uh, share with us a little bit about your uh, childhood? Uh, as I learned, you were born in, uh, in Europe. You moved uh, 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 thousands of miles distance from the place you were born to the Australia. So you're asking me about my history from day yes, one? Yes, um, a little bit of your childhood. Okay, I was born in uh, in Feldafin, um, um, uh, a place just outside of Munich in a refugee camp after the Second World War. My parents were Polish, uh, previously married, uh, lost all their uh, immediate family, um, uh, wife, husband, children, etc. And uh, I came to them very late in life. Um, um, my father was a cabinet maker and uh, he, he had his name down for America and Australia and uh, there's someone in Australia that uh, asked for a cabinet maker in a particular factory. So we migrated from, uh, from Germany to Australia in, uh, we arrived in Australia in 1950. I see. The first, the, the first three years in a, in a refugee camp here. Uh, where my father commuted 100 kilometers for, uh, for work uh, to uh, Perth, we're on the west coast of uh, Australia. 
uh, that was basically my early childhood um, we, we uh, when we shifted to uh, to uh, uh, Perth near his work when I was about uh, two years old roughly two three years old and um, and we shared a family with uh, shared a house with three other families for the first two or three years of our life there that's, uh, that's early childhood <laughs> and how was your experience when you were a kid? How are you good pupil you were in the school? Did you like a school at all? I, uh, oh, no, I didn't like school. I didn't like the discipline. I didn't like, uh, I didn't see the point of a lot of what we were being taught. Um, so no, I, I didn't like school. I had a lot of fun at school, but I didn't like it. I didn't like and... the school. I didn't like the schooling. And where did you walk away from the school? What was your age? Um, well, I, I had a scholarship when I was 15. Um, and then I, uh, I actually left home then for, I had conflict with my father. And, uh, we didn't get on well at that stage. I was very rebellious. So uh, I came back after about two or three weeks, uh, finished school, matriculated, and left home and uh, went to university. Uh, but uh, uh, not to study, to have a good time. So, well, I had a very, very good time at the university, but I, I didn't qualify. I did. Uh, I did. I had. I had part of a law degree. I had part of a commerce degree, but uh, incomplete. I didn't. I didn't finish. And what was your first business experience? Where did you make your first thousand uh, dollars? My first experience. Well, I. I it was in. I started a gift company. And uh, I had no idea what I was doing, uh, but I, I just decided that that's what I wanted to do. I liked, uh, I found a cutlery set that I liked the look of from uh, from Scandinavia, and uh, decided that that's what I wanted to do. I learned very quickly that uh, a Scandinavian product in Australia was too expensive, and then sort of evolved from that. But I was basically working from home, um, but just hard work. That's all it was. It was just hard work with uh, without any money. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the how long you were, let's say, uh, from the from the day one as an entrepreneur until the the, the first company, Skansen, uh, become a something, uh, let's say, sustainable. How how long uh, did it take? Uh, uh, Skansen was sustainable uh, in a very very short period of time because uh, I didn't have any overhead, overheads. It was just me. It was just me operating from home, so what are my expenses? So um, I didn't have to sell very much to uh, to be viable, uh, not making not making much money. But, it, but in a very short period of time, I I, uh, I I became quite successful because I I I did a lot of the hard yards. I had no experience, I had no mentor, so um, a lot of what I did I had to learn myself as I was going. So I spent a lot of time with retailers, learning, showing them product, getting to understand. And, um, and, and, and through trade magazines, through various sources, I, I found a couple of good products which seemed to be very good. Um, they, they took off and uh, the business took off. I see. And uh, in the end, you know, the, 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 your face with Scanson uh, 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 flourishing with the IPO of a Scanson. Uh, when did you come uh, uh, to the point that you decide that, that you should uh, introduce uh, more investors into your company? Um, and was it a I've hard never, decision for you? I've never, I've never introduced investors into my company, and uh, and I never will, if you can never say never, uh, because I like to have control over my own destiny. Mm -hmm. uh, so the the idea of you, you understand, I started the business in '74. And I had the ambition of um, of becoming Australia wide, and because I was in Perth, in the most isolated capital city of the world, mm -hmm. and I wanted to sell throughout Australia, Sydney and Melbourne were the main market. So that's sell like selling from uh, New York to Los Angeles and mm -hmm. distance wise. So or the other way around, Los Angeles to New York. So um, it took five days for the product to be transported from the west coast to the east coast. And I learned very quickly, there was no point in my having the same product as everyone else because I could just buy it locally, quick delivery rather than waiting for my. So I had to do stuff that was different, innovative. And that became part of my DNA, not because I was particularly creative and not because I, I had this desire. It was simple, my perception, it was necessity. 
And it was that necessity that became part of my DNA to think differently, to look at things differently, and to do stuff differently that no one else has got and be ahead of the market. Mm -hmm. That was quite unusual, uh, I don't know, 45 odd years ago. Um, but that's become, that became part of my DNA, part of my strength, and that's what transposed into Moose. And that's one of the reasons why Moose is so successful. It's very innovative, very creative, and we, we do set trends. Mm -hmm. But obviously, uh, Scanson was on a small scale with Australia at that stage, a population of about 20 million. And now, uh, now Moose, we sell to the world, but that's a separate story. So the IPO was not to introduce other investors. The IPO was for me, for me to sell out. I needed to get out. I wanted to get out. I had enough. I'd accomplished everything I wanted to accomplish. And the purpose of it was to extract myself from the business. And what and was your uh, what was your feeling uh, uh, in the moment of uh, of, uh, of selling uh, the Scansen? It was your baby. Did yeah, you I have any? Uh, no, there was no remorse because obviously it was my baby, and I, I felt strongly about the company. But you you got to understand. I'd had enough and I had this feeling of being trapped. And this is probably something very relevant to um, the entrepreneurs you have in Croatia. Is that, I mean, when I started Scanson and right up to about a year before I, I, I exited the company, I had a very strong passion for the company. I loved getting up in the morning, didn't matter how many hours I was working, 14, 16 hours a day, seven days a week, didn't worry me because I really, really enjoyed it. I had a goal, I had an ambition, I loved it. Uh, by the time I was ready to sell out, that had gone. No other reason, no more complicated than that. So what was my emotion? Relief to get out. And did you have a clear idea at the moment you were selling, you were immediately go to invest in some other business? Or no, 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 no. Uh, my goal was to retire. So from that was around about uh, in early 1990, 1991. And my, I was never, I was 40 odd years old and I had no intention of working again. That, was, that was my ambition. So I, I was very busy. I had a lot of projects which I can go into, but none of them were related to being in business. So, um, you know, I can still remember many times wishing there was more hours in the day so I could continue to do more of what I was doing, which I'm happy to explain, but it's not relevant to your question. So um, the, the time that, uh, uh, Moose came about because I was uh, somebody had approached me about this small company doing about six million turnover, uh, employing about ten people uh, to invest in. So Moose was supposed to be an investment. I wasn't supposed to be part of it, and uh, I invested with my uh, ex brother-in-law and his partner, which is a story in itself. And, and they were supposed to run the company with the previous owner. I was supposed to be chairman, just a a uh, third investor with them, and that was it. But uh, things went very wrong between the three of them, which I can go into, it's not relevant. And I ended up buying them out, and I shifted from Perth to Melbourne to fix the company up and sell it off. So there was no ambition, there was no desire to get back involved in the business world. So have no illusions about the fact that oh, I sold one company and then I was going to start up another company and I was going to get involved in it. That's not how it transpired. And the, in the meantime, just as an investor trying to save the company and mess uh, what, what, what happened inside, you involved yourself deeply into the operations. Correct. And reluctantly, uh, re reluctantly, I might add. And uh, if you can measure intensity, uh, of involvement and the passion today with the Moose Toys and the previously in your first life in the Wisconsin, how you will uh, compare these two situations? Oh, you, you must understand that I'm, uh, my basic nature is very competitive um, and uh, a lot of my energy um, up to the age of 40, 45 went into sport which I can go into as well, but not relevant now. So um, how do I compare my passion in Moose versus, versus Scanson? Um, the, the passion is still there because of that desire to be successful and do your very best. But the very big difference is that everything was on my shoulders at Scanson. And here at Moose, particularly in the last, uh, last uh, 
four or five years, we have a lot of really talented people that do a lot of the work. Uh, you know, we have guide, we have guidelines, we have uh, uh, culture, we have uh, expectations, the way we do things. But there's other people that are doing it, not me. Just uh, in in the in the in the few sentences, can you explain to our audience, which is maybe not uh, familiar with, with, with the Moose Toys, how large is the company today? Well, we employ somewhere between five and six hundred people, um, mainly involved in product development, engineering, design, creative, packaging, uh, etc. We're, we've got offices around the world. Um, we've got a big operation in Hong Kong and China, mainly to do with uh, shipping and engineering and quality control. Um, they, there's no creative work that goes on there. All the creative work is out of Melbourne. Uh, we've got an LA office of about 60 odd people, mainly marketing and sales. Um, we've got uh, and we've got a UK office that we bought, a company we bought about two years ago, I think, two, three years ago which has been very successful, 60 odd people there. And the UK company is now our hub for going into Europe direct. But our model was to sell internationally through distributors. So we didn't need people on the ground in the, in the various countries our overheads were comparatively low. So the model was simply to sell to the distributors on a lower margin. They would get the bulk of the profit, uh, but we would control everything. We always have controlled everything. Uh, roughly, roughly the size of the company. Great. Really? And uh, can you uh, share with us a little bit of uh, your view and experience how much COVID-19 hit your uh, uh, previous business model? Did you change anything? Did you need to adapt? Uh, and how you see the situation with the COVID-19? Well, the, for us, you, you know, you've got to understand creative people being together is important in terms of they feed off each other and creative people tend to be quite emotional and uh, supportive of each other. And suddenly uh, we're all isolated in our homes um, and it's created all sorts of uh, uh, tensions, uh, emotional issues, and um, uh, not just for us, obviously, for a lot of other people. So we've been able to continue through Zoom. So that, that's, that's, that's been working fine for us. And uh, that our productivity is still not as great as it was, but it's still good. But it's different. It's not the same as it was. So that's had an effect on us. Not being in the office has had an effect on us. You may or may not be aware, but uh, Melbourne has been in lockdown now for quite a while. And when I say lockdown, a high level of lockdown, because we've had, so we've had a lot of deaths and a lot of infections, mainly due to government incompetence, which is another story. So it's created all sorts of pressures here within the organisation. So since basically since March, since the middle of March, our UK office, 60 odd people, our LA office, 60 odd people, and our Melbourne office, 400 odd people, I don't know what, 300, 400 people, uh, have all been working from home. So has that changed the way we operate? Has that changed? Uh, huge, huge changes. But we've adapted. It's like a lot of, lot of things. Um, you can only deal with the reality that's in front of you, and you can only make the best of what, what's there. So that is what we're doing. And what about the consumers? Do they uh, buy uh, regularly the toys? Do they buy more or do they buy less? Well, in Australia, certainly they bought more. And in America now, they've bought more. Europe, Europe is a basket case, by the way, on toys um, uh, for a variety of reasons. But in Australia and America, which is our main market, of course, uh, America has been very strong. But what, what has happened, if you ask me, the effect of, uh, of uh, what's transpired is online, which, you know, have to be a rocket scientist to know that, uh, you know, the online thing is huge. And there's been, Amazon's become a lot stronger. Uh, Walmart has become much, much stronger online. Target have done a fantastic job of uh, click and collect where you order the product online and you drive to the store and somebody will put everything in your car so you don't have to, there's no contact. That's Target, Target's done a brilliant job of that. So in reality, the American toy market has actually gone up, strange as it may sound. But I'm, that's strange, it shouldn't be that strange because what's happened is there's certain categories which we're not particularly strong in, 
that have done well, arts and crafts, games, uh, et cetera, et cetera. It's basically for entertaining children at home. Where we were more focused on more the novelty, creative, crazy stuff. And tell me how someone who is 70 plus, don't get me wrong, can be the ideal person to decide what would be the next new toy for the five years old girl? Listen, if I was subject to being uh, personally insulted, you just did a very, very good job. Um, and it's, uh, it's, not, it's, again, it's not, it's experience. You know, we, we know from experience about uh, what, what resonates and it comes from years and years of experience. Um, I don't think age is a criteria. Uh, but, and the reason for it, you know, we call it, we call it WOW, W-O-W. And that is that if you look at something and you go, wow, that's incredible. That's a great starting point. And if we don't go, wow, when we look at new, new product we're developing, we, we don't continue with it. So our standard of innovation, our standard of creativity is so far ahead of most other people because it, it's a total focus on us. So we're not dealing with the same stuff that everyone else is doing the day in, day out, et cetera, et cetera. So when you mentioned the 70 year old, and I'll come back to that, not that I'm insulted in any shape or form. We have got, we've got a team of people that, that, uh, that know, know this stuff, that are good at it, et cetera, et cetera. And they've been educated as part of the, um, <clears throat> part of our process of what to look for, what's different, et cetera, et cetera. So it's not, it's not it may sound it's like everything else. If you don't, if you're not an expert in the field, it seems and looks difficult. But if you have a look at any any uh, any industry, any business, anyone, if somebody's an expert in that area, and you're not, the chances are you're going to say, you know, how on earth could they possibly succeed? I mean, that's and, and everyone's an expert when the product's out in the marketplace, not just in toys and selling. Everyone's an authority. But prior to that, even even our buyers, even some very stupid buyers, they don't get it. They just don't understand. And why is something so unusual and so different? And a lot of time it's experimentation. You put something out in the marketplace and it doesn't, you, you're 100% sure it's going to work, but it doesn't. And other stuff you think, oh, it's unusual, it should work. And suddenly you can't believe it. It's suddenly taken off like a rocket. But that's no different from any other uh, uh, innovative product. It doesn't have to be just toys. Just for my, for my curiosity, do you have any uh, data? What is the percentage of the toys? Uh, which are uh, focused on the kids, which are uh, bought by the adults for themselves? That's a very good question. That's not something that we're focused on. I mean, what we do... It, it should be some percentage. On, what we do focus on is that, um, uh, especially for higher priced items, that it's a parent buying it for the child. This you know, sure, yes. impulse, you know, you, you walk down the aisle and then you something for $5 or $3 and the child's calling out for it, the mother will buy it without hesitation. But once you get to, you know, $40, 50 $60, the parents are involved and, uh, and they are part of the decision-making process. But do they buy it for themselves? And could they? We've got a product now that we believe um, parents will probably buy for themselves. It's a very unusual, very innovative product that could possibly win toy of the year, so unusual. But it's it's uh, it's of the nature that parents would buy it for themselves. But that's not a strategy on our part. That's not our focus. Our focus is simply uh, four to ten year olds, maybe four to twelve year olds now. Bi ovo prvi dio razgovora Emila Tedeski i meni Astula. Ostanite dalje uz nas. Vidimo se uskoro. Dobrodošli natrag u posljednju epizodu posebnog izdanja poduzetničkog mindseta na kojem donosimo najbolje rezove sa istoimene konferencije. Nastavljamo s razgovorom Emila Tedeskija i Manja Stula. The one question when, the, when, when, the, when anyone is talking to the successful people, uh, 
and uh, individuals. Uh, what was your feeling the moment you became a billionaire? Uh, probably I know the answer, but I'm asking this uh, not because I'm a billionaire myself, but uh, I can uh, uh, intuitively uh, come to the answer. But I would like to learn from you. Uh, did you change at all when you saw your name on the billionaire list? uh did it mean anything to you like okay uh i did it i prove it to my father to whom i didn't go well uh in my childhood did you did you fix your relationship with your with your with your dad now you're talking about three different things here let's go back to the the one with my father what was your question about my father did you fix your relationship because uh, you said you had the... Uh... Uh, yeah, yeah, okay. So uh, both my parents were always very supportive of me. Uh, there's no question. But my father was a very strong willed and um, he had no grey areas in his uh, belief system. Probably one of the reasons why he's so healthy. He, uh, everything was black and white for him. There's no, no, uh, no, uh, no grey areas. And unfortunately, in retrospect, most of the time he was right. And when I say unfortunately, because at that time when I was a teenager, I didn't believe he was right. So hence the conflict, and we're both very strong-willed. Uh, when I started my own business, um, and I started to become quite successful myself, I realised it wasn't my father that had the issue, it was me that had the issue, because it was the way I was responding to him. Because he is who he is, and he was who he was, I should say. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that. It's just the way that I was perceiving it and I was treating it because he just always spoke what was on his mind. He didn't, he didn't carry, he just, it was just always 100% honest. And a lot of what he said to me, I didn't agree with and I didn't like. Um, so hence one of the many reasons we had conflict. But um, when my business started to take off, um, our relationship improved dramatically. And it had nothing to do with the success of the business. What it, what it was to do with was the way that I was perceived. He didn't change. He was exactly the same before, after, in between, whatever. It was me. So I dropped all that trying to fight him and argue with him and doing whatever. And uh, our relationship was fantastic. Um, when I was uh, when I was about, you see, I'm uh, I'm Jewish, and both my parents. Um, suffered hugely during the war. And my father uh, was probably one of the most intelligent people I know. He spoke 10 languages, he's self-educated. Um, he, uh, he was leader of his trade union in, uh, in Mods in Poland. And um, he, was, he was what I would call an intellectual giant. But in spite of his intelligence, and in spite of his logic, he would not buy anything German simply out of principle for what transpired during the war and what he saw transpire. So when I was about 26, I, uh, I had the opportunity of, uh, at that stage, you could lease a car and get full tax deductibility. Again, not important. But the car I wanted to get, I can still remember clearly, it was a BMW 320i. So, so I can still see it to this day. And I went to him and I said, look, this is the car I'm going to get. This is the reason, this is the logical reason why I'm going to hold it, holds the best appreciation value. It's a big decision on my part, et cetera, et cetera. Again, I gave him all the reasons why, the logical reasons why that's the car I wanted to get. And he said, I said, if you don't want me to get it, I won't get it. It's simple as that. And he said, look, it's your life, it's your money, it's your decision. He said he wouldn't buy it, but he's genuinely okay with me buying it. So I, I, I bought the, that car. My next car, because I happen to like cars a lot, my next car was a Porsche 911. Now, that's a completely different ball game. But again, I went to him and I said, look, I'm whatever it was. What I found out afterwards, this is the point I'm trying to make, what I found out afterwards is that my father was boasting to his friends that his son was driving a, a very expensive sports car. So our relationship improved dramatically, but not, again, not from, not from, from him. It, it all came from me. So our relationship was fine all the way up to when he died from uh, for the next twenty odd years. Yeah, nice to hear. And what about the first billion? Ah, that's a different story. Um, 
I was talked into by my marketing people to do an interview um, with the Australian Financial Review. They thought it would be a very good thing for the company. So I did the interview. It went well. But what I didn't know was the guy that did, that did, the, uh, did the interview was the guy in charge of making the billionaire list in Australia. And he put me on the billionaire list. And I was furious. I went to, I went, we, we, we got a top class lawyer, one of the best in Australia. And I went to him and I said, look, I want this stopped. You can sue them, you can do whatever, but I just want it stopped. And he said, he, I can still remember his exact words. He said, it's, 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 you will create more trouble by trying to stop it than just letting it go. So if you ask me how I felt about it, I was angry, extremely angry because I prefer not to be an ironically becoming the EY entrepreneur of the year. But I, I, prior to that, I definitely didn't want to be known. I didn't want to be seen. So if my reaction, I wasn't happy about it. And how was your, uh, uh, how did you feel at the moment when in Monaco you've been a, a multi-entrepreneur uh, entrepreneur of the world by EY? The most, um, the most impactful thing for me at the time when I won it, and I, I didn't, I wasn't, I'd been told that I wasn't going to win it by somebody that was on the inside. So I, when I won it, it was a huge shock, a genuine shock. In fact, I was in the toilet when they were about to announce it because I, I knew, I believed I had no chance, so it didn't, was academic. But my immediate reaction, and it's ironic that you mentioned my father, uh, I wish my mother and father were there. The moral and ethics into uh, a, a business. More about uh, of, uh, continuously telling uh, the truth to the people, or uh, potentially what uh, about uh, not telling the truth or uh, uh, lying. How this can uh, affect the relationship and the business in general. So, one thing I'd like to address. Um, uh, lessons that I've learned in business. I think one of the uh, very early lessons I learned was the importance of honesty and integrity. Now, when I started my, my gift company in, in Perth and Western Australia, uh, I, I wanted to sell all over Western Australia to start off with. And Western Australia is huge, it's bigger than most countries. It's a massive area. If you look on the map, it's like 3,000 square miles. So, um, there's a lot of country towns of you know, 5,000, 6,000 people. And I wanted to sell giftware into them. And I had no idea how to do it. So I would ring the local, uh, link, ring the local phone operator and ask, where, where would you go for giftware? Most of the time in those small towns, it was either a, a chemist or a, a, a pharmacy, a news agent that would carry an a area of giftware. So I would get in contact with the number one place in town and I'd develop a relationship with them over the phone. And what I learned very, very quickly, and it took me like five minutes to learn it, I wanted these guys to buy product from me on trust. I wanted them to trust me completely. So I learned very quickly, if I want them to trust me, they have to believe that I'm 100% honest. So the moment that, and, I, and this is my lesson, I was always very, very honest with these guys. That's, and then this is my lesson to you. The moment that you lie to somebody and you get caught, that trust is lost forever. The relationship can continue. The uh, things can keep going on. But somewhere in the back of their mind, they don't entirely trust you. That was imperative for me for that to occur. That became part of my DNA. And I've transferred that. It, it certainly, I transmitted that throughout the company in, in my gift days. And it's certainly been transmitted through the 550-odd people at, uh, at, uh, at, uh, at Moose. The... And everything comes from the top. And if they understand that there's a clear cut cultural um, way of doing stuff, everyone's on the same page. And I say that in the, in the context of when we decided to go into America direct, and other than Lego, no external company had ever been successful in America. There were so many companies that had come in and failed. And again, I can go into the story of how we were successful in America, but one of the things that we did we were 100% honest with Walmart, Target, and Amazon. 100% honest with them. If we said to them that we were going to spend a million dollars on TV promoting the product, 
yet we didn't have enough sales to justify that. We still spent the money because we'd given our word. So that integrity, that honesty, um, they they absolutely love us because they, they think Australia, everyone in Australia is honest because of the way we've handled it. But everything we do with them is on the highest level of integrity. Uh, so much so that in 2017, I think, we won uh, Supplier of the Year to Walmart, Target and Amazon. And no one had won all three in one year because they, they don't like to award it to, you know, uh, Amazon don't like uh, Target, having a Target, et cetera, et cetera. So my point being that if you want to be successful, uh, it's not necessary. It's so tempting to lie, to expand, to, especially if you're selling so I say one of the things that's very, very important, I'm talking about being honest, I'm not talking about being stupid honest. Like if you see somebody that's really overweight, you don't say, oh, you're fat. That's being honest, but it's not being nice and it's not appropriate. So, I mean, to use your common sense. But I do say um, maintaining a trust and an honesty and a relationship with people, with everyone you deal with, is very, very important. For example, with our factories in China, Always, always, we've treated them with, with respect and we've always paid them on time. And we know people that try to take advantage of the factories in China. They try to screw them, they try to squeeze them, they try to take advantage, especially if they're in a position of strength. And uh, we've never done that. So what happens is that if the factories have got uh, 8,000 people and they've got um, only a certain number of workers and, and suddenly things become very, very busy, we always get preference because they trust us, they, they know us, <clears throat> they know what we stand for. And if we say we're going to pay them in 30 days, we always pay them before the 30 days is up. So again, I, what I'm trying to convey to you is if you want to be really successful in business, I think it's important to maintain a high degree of honesty, integrity, and, and it's hard to win, but once you've got it, you've got it for life, but you can lose it just like that by one silly moment. And even with relationships, and I say that with, uh, with tongue in cheek, um, if you're in a relationship with somebody, your partner, wife, husband, girlfriend, boyfriend, et cetera, et cetera, and you cheat on them, and it goes on all the time, I know that, but if you cheat on them and you get caught, there is no way they're ever going to trust you again. Now, so you'll stay together for a variety of reasons, children, finance, habit, I can go on and on and on the reason why people stay together, but that's never the same, ever. So just bear that in mind. It's, uh, I think it's a very, very important lesson if you want to be really successful. And life's easier. It's so uncomplicated. You don't have to worry about who you said what to and did you lie and do it. If anyone asks me anything, I know I can always say exactly what's on my mind because it's the truth. I don't have to try and think, did I say that? Did I, did I expand those numbers? Was it bigger, smaller, et cetera, et cetera? So that's, I just think it's important that you, you know that. The other thing perhaps that, that a lesson is culture. You have to look after your people. You've got to treat them with the same degree of respect that you expect yourself. I know it's in all the books and all of whatever it is, but it's the, the, it's the actions that are important. The, the, the words and the, uh, the behaviour, uh, um, the words I'm talking about and the, uh, and the doctrines that you have are meaningless. It's your behaviour that's important. So you treat your people with respect. You treat them as you would expect to be treated. And, uh, and make sure that they believe in your vision as much as you do. And uh, the, maybe the last question, because uh, they are t telling me that we are running out of time, and I, I think that the audience will appreciate that we extend a little bit the conversation. It is about your position now in the, in the global EY jury uh, thinking and deciding uh, who is going to be next uh, EY entrepreneur of year. How is uh, to be on the side of the jury and uh, evaluating uh, national champions where uh, all of them are great entrepreneurs and only ones need uh, uh, to have the prize? Um, how do I feel about the process? I tell you, it's a lot easier being on that side than being a, a candidate, I can tell you. Uh, certainly a lot less, uh, lot less pressure. Um, but the, uh, the, the, the EY have got a very good process in terms of arriving at the winner. And it's, a, it's a, like a seven or eight point checklist. And um, every year I've been in part bar one, and even in that one, I, I knew who the winner was, even though there's a bit of contention. Um, the, it, the winner stands out. 
and you always narrow it down to one or two people, but the winner stands out. Like this last year it was a no-brainer. The uh, the woman from India was just a quantum leap above. A remarkable woman, just remarkable on many levels. So it's not, it's, it's it sounds like an onerous process, and it is. It's quite lengthy, but it's a it's a. I think it's a, as fair and as equitable as you can get, and the right winner is always chosen. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, uh, look, uh, uh, Manny, we, we could go, uh, and I would have a bunch of other uh, uh, questions, but uh, I would like uh, uh, to thank you for your uh, uh, very honest uh, approach. Maybe my question were a little bit more uh, uh, personal than you would expect it, because uh, the, the, my idea was to show to the audience, uh, which are uh, uh, hundreds of entrepreneurs and the high-level executives, that everything uh, behind the business it's uh, very much emotional it's uh, individual it's a uh, personal and there is uh, in the end uh, the huge hard work huge hard work and uh, dedication and that uh, no success is happening uh, over the nights and also if someone is a real entrepreneur always stays entrepreneur it is always the first second third chance and uh, the ball is always within the uh, within the uh, playground it's just important to play and try to win sure but Thanks. i think i think i think one thing is very very important for um, for croatia there's uh, there's four million people in croatia this rule. So, um, with a country the size of Croatia, uh, entrepreneurship is critical. Um, yeah, and whatever whatever is being developed in, in, and I'm sure there's a great pool of talent in Croatia, and whatever is being developed in Croatia, whoever's developing it, whoever's doing the entrepreneurship, they have to think globally. They have to think uh, aspirationally. Um, does the product, does what they're doing, does the technology, does whatever it is that they're doing, can that have an impact on the world? Because the, the, there is no question, it's a shrinking world, even though the, the coronavirus, of course, has sort of separated people a bit more, but it is, there's no question um, uh, that the global aspect is imperative. If you can't, if it can't work globally, think twice about doing it. Um, the second thing I would say, is that if you have a look at um, a country the size of Croatia with 4 million people, you have a look at a country like Israel. I don't know what the population of Israel is, uh, 4, 5, 6 million or whatever it is. So Israel is, uh, is surrounded in one of the most hostile environments that you can possibly imagine. I mean, the, most of the surrounding countries are bent on the destruction of Israel. Um, and look at the technology and look at the entrepreneurship coming out of Israel little tiny country that's, uh, that's doing so much great stuff. Um, extraordinary. And uh, and I say that, that uh, and, but it's become part of the culture there now. It's like, you know, and then the, the culture now is that, uh, you know, I visited there a few years ago and the, the culture there now is that if you, you have to fail one, two, three times before you, you really succeed. And they're accepting it that way. If you look at places like America, you know, if you if you fail, then that you're tarnished with a with a brush of uh, that you're a failure and uh, whatever. Uh, but in Israel, it's a mark of honour. It's a, it's just part of your learning process, part of your evolution, and um, and until you end up striking it and striking it hot. And there's a, m most of the people I spoke to in Israel that have been very successful on the entrepreneur side of it and the innovation have been very unsuccessful prior to that. And they've had businesses that have failed and so on. So all I say is that um, I think it's very important for a country the size of Croatia to, uh, to, to be innovative, to be creative, and to think globally. And I re-emphasize the global uh, aspect of it. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, uh, many stool. Bili su ovo Emil Tedeski i Meni Stool. Ostanite dalje uz nas jer slijede poslane vijesti koje su obilježile tjedan.
Europski parlament traži donošenje modernih pravila za internetske platforme i trgovine, uključujući i obvezujući mehanizam za suzbijanje nezakonitog sadržaja na internetu, kako bi zakonodavstvo Europske unije išlo u korak s vremenom. Naime, postojeća direktiva o elektroničkoj trgovini, koja je temelj digitalnog tržišta, donesena je prije 20 godina, te ju je potrebno prilagoditi novim okolnostima poslovanja na internetu, istaknuli su zastupnici. Prijedlozi za koje se zalažu uključuju zahtjev da nova pravila budu obvezujuće i za poduzeća s poslovnim nastanom izvan Europske unije ako su njihove usluge namijenjene europskim korisnicima ili potrošačima, te da pri kupnji na internetu treba vrijediti isto pravilo kao i u tradicionalnim trgovinama. Što je nezakonito izvan interneta, treba biti nezakonito i na internetu. Europarlamentarci su zatražili uvođenje novog načela upoznaj svoje klijenta, koje bi obvezivalo platforme da provjeravaju tvrtke što se koriste njihovim uslugama te da spričavaju prodaju nesigurnih proizvoda ili širanje dezinformacija. Predlažu i nova pravila za spričavanje nefunkcioniranja tržišta zbog velikih digitalnih kompanija koje trenutačno diktiraju uvjete i za potrošače i za svoje konkurente, a žele i korisnicima dati veću kontrolu nad time što vide na internetu, odnosno omogućiti im da u potpunosti odustanu od prilagođenog sadržaja te da budu manje ovisni o algoritmima. Kako bi se osiguralo poštovanje novih pravila, zastupnici predlažu procjenu mogućnosti osnivanja europskog tijela koje bi bilo nadležno za nadzor i određivanje kazni. Zbog povećanog broja novo oboljelih od koronavirusa u Zagrebu i epidemioloških mjera, otkazan je Zagrebački advent. Potvrdila je to Olivera Majić, zamjenica Zagrebačkog gradonačelnika. Majić je naglasila kako će onaj prepoznatljivi advent zamijeniti nekakav drugi model, no još ne znaju kako bi to trebalo izgledati. Razrađujemo epidemiološke mjere i vidjet ćemo nakon svih svetih ćemo imati više informacija, rekla je Majić. Samsung Galaxy Z Fold 2 5G pametni je telefon uz kojeg možete multitaskati lakom kontrolom rasporeda zaslona i istovremenim otvaranjem više datoteka iz iste aplikacije. Stvaranje impresivnih fotografija i video zapisa sada je još lakše, a mnoge će razveseliti i mogućnost snimanja bez ruku. Samsung Galaxy Z Fold 2 5G pruža i potpuno novo iskustvo s dizajnom uz kojeg ćete osjećati kao da imate dva uređaja u jednom. Dok je pametni telefon sklopljen, veličina zaslona je 6,2 inča, a za potpuni doživljaj sadržaja otvorite zadivljajući 7,6 inčni zaslon koji je izrađen od iznimno tankog savitljivog stakla. Na velikom zaslonu možete neometano koristiti sve aplikacije jednako kao i kada je pametni telefon sklopljen. U novom broju časopisa Poduzetnik pročitajte ostvaruje li se upravo ovih dana ona kineska da bog da živio u zanimljiva vremena. Sadržaj obiluje intervjujima sa zanimljivim ljudima, mudrim mislima rođenima u koroni kao i odabranim temama koje su za poduzetnike ovog doba neizbježne. Kako se postaviti u novonastaloj situaciji, kada ćemo prestati govoriti da je nešto odgođeno zbog pandemije, dolazi li vrijeme neke nove ekonomije, imamo li prave uzore u društvu, koliko danas vrijede informacije i koliko je važno povezivanje po zajedni Mindsetu. Umrežite se s uspješnima i ostanite na izvoru poduzetničkih informacija uz časopis Poduzetnik i sve naše projekte s oznakom kvalitete Poduzetnički mindset. Bila ovo serija epizoda posvećenih konferenciji Poduzetnički mindset u kojima smo mogli čuti brojna razmišljanja i poglede na poduzetništvo i život u Hrvatskoj. Budući da emisija ekipe koja razvija časopis Poduzetnik, emisiju Poduzetnički mindset, kao isto imenu konferenciju, učiniti poduzetnike liderima društva, nastavljamo dalje još jači. I zato nas pratite dalje putem društvenih mreža kao i web stranice poduzetnik.biz. Hvala vam na pozornosti, vidimo se ponovo uskoro.